This is Godot. It's awesome. It makes games. Let's make a game with it. Okay, so we have the nodes within the current scene here. At first it gives you the option for 2D, 3D, a user interface or some other type. Here the current scene, you can open and close them as tabs. All the properties of your current selection will be displayed over here. And the file system down here contains all the assets of your current project. So we'll choose scene, make a 3D root node. Then we'll add another node, a mesh instance 3D for the ground. And we'll give it a plain mesh shape. I'll rename this ground. So let's make it longer on the X axis scale, then a little wider on the Z axis. Give it a material override. First, change the albedo, the main color of the surface. I'll give it a dark orange tan. Then drag the texture over, under UV1, scale X up to form a little line pattern of the repeating texture. Now we're going to add a static body. This is great for solid parts of an environment, but it needs a collision shape to define what is static. Add in a collision shape 3D. Give this one a reliable world boundary shape. Since the ground was stretched out before, We'll just drag and drop it on the node 3D root node. Then reset the scale. Wherever we set this node will be the global ground, where no player character can go below it. Speaking of the player character, add another node. And we'll re-hit Mesh Instance 3D. We'll rename the sphere, choose a sphere shape, and then move it up. So now we'll add a rigid body 3D and attach the mesh. Reset the scale of the sphere mesh, but then move the rigid body up instead, so they're not misaligned. And we need a collision mesh for this one also. We'll add that in, and give it a sphere shape. Now when a collision node is attached to a rigid body, it can actually move and interact. When attached to a static body, it can't move mid-game. The sphere collision is an efficient preset. Simply change the radius to give the collision size. Let's give this one a material. We'll change the albedo color. I'll turn on emission two. Set default black, and when you increase the brightness, it glows. And we'll drag the image texture onto albedo and emission. Then under UV1 settings, adjust the XYZ, and also the roughness and emission levels. You can see the effect if you focus in on the object, then play with the color of emission and albedo. Okay, that's clear. A simple way to distinguish the roll, position, and angle of the sphere. Now let's add a camera. We can hit play, save the scene first, but the lights won't match. See up here you've got the sun button and the world button. But these are previews in the editor only. Click the dots for more detail on these. You can add these in as nodes to then render in-game. Press play current scene, or F6, and we hope the ball will go from where it is now in the air and drop onto the ground. Awesome, it lands. You can also turn on the GI and AO, which will look even better. If you press the main play button, you've got to set a main scene, and this will just be the first opening scene of the game. We can just say current scene. Nice. And by the way, if you want a more holistic Godot guide, check out my beginner Godot Udemy course. It covers a whole lot in full step-by-step -step detail. Okay, let's make this sphere a player. Player input can be set up here, but there are already built-in ones. Just note the names like UI underscore, left, right, or UI select for the spacebar. Now Godot uses GDScript, its native language. Attach a script to the rigid body. The template tells you what type of node the script is attached to. It autofills rigid body 3D. If I attach a script to a mesh 3D, the same thing. Now with mesh instance 3D after extends at the very first line of the code. This means that when we give specific commands to that type of node, it can understand it and know where to look. Our pass will pass the code through without erroring. We can replace this with our commands. VAR changes color to let us know it's a variable. Red highlights indicate the line isn't finished yet. 
We can't just have var without anything else. Whatever we put after this will be the name of our macro, a combination of code into one word. For example, long for longitude, left to right. But you can name this anything, direction, cheese, or up and down, if you want to confuse anyone looking at the script. But then we give an equal sign to say, this word in the script will mean, and we will add, in this case, an input receiver. Then dot to tell it what type of input to listen for. Then use get action strength with brackets to specify the name of the input. Let's do UI write. We can test if things worked quickly with a print check. Print checks show up in the output at the bottom of the editor. It's repeating so much because it's in process. Put it in ready, and it only processes it once at the very start for one hello world. You can print all sorts of things besides just a phrase. Without quotes, I'll put in long. Now it outputs one, if the UI right, right arrow key is pressed, zero, if it is not pressed. This is exactly what we need. Let's do the left direction now. So how do we do that? We make it negative one, the exact opposite to the right input. So we'll do minus input, get action strength, UI left. Now long means both right and left. A simple little machine combining both directions. So far so good. Zero is no direction, one is right, minus one is left. Now the script can tell the difference between left and right. So in a rigid body node, it records the physics and velocity. So this matches up perfectly with our x-axis. We just say that the strength of the longitude left and right arrow keys equals a force. That's the preset linear velocity. Adding a dot is like going into a submenu of the velocity. So we can choose an axis. Let's choose x. The key press is already equal to one or minus one. And in the game world, positive x is right and negative x is left if we're looking from the front. Hey, how good is that? We just need to pump up the power now. Multiply by 100. Woo, all right. <laughs> That's fast. Multiply by 10. Okay, nice. Now, velocity doesn't just start and stop suddenly like this. Let's smooth it out for realistic motion. Add lerp. We can right click and look up the symbol. It shows us how this lerp machine works. From velocity right now to velocity maximum speed. After that, how fast does it reach? Okay, we'll set play. All right, yes, that looks smooth. You can divide or multiply delta to speed up or slow down over time too. Now the camera. We'll give it a script. One of the shared or global properties is the position of the node. So we can say position x again. That equals a lerp from where the camera is now to the ball's rigid body position on x. So the camera will move to the position of the ball only on the left and right x axis as we're looking at it now. It won't go up and down on y, or move closer or further away on z. Let's add a jump. We'll add another variable and we'll say input dot is action just pressed. It notes a tap of a key. It doesn't care if it's held or not. We'll print check. And now it's true each time we press the space bar. Only once. But if we use is action pressed, it will keep adding jumps every millisecond. So we'll go with is action just pressed. So now, if jump input received, we will access for the first time our rigid body physics forces. We will apply an impulse, a sudden force of velocity all at once, in the up direction. And we can't just give it the numbers, we need to wrap that in a vector three so that it knows how to use the numbers correctly. Okay, it works, but not quite really. Let's turn process into physics process. Now it will properly slice the updates to allow proper rigid body physics. Proper gravity will be activated. Oh, well, that's just fantastic. Make the constant forces negative on Y to create more of a gravity pull. Okay, I wanna add in a ramp. Let's add a mesh instance 3D. I'll rename it to ramp. We'll make the mesh a prism. and a collision. 
from a static body, we'll call this obstacles so we can add more in, and a collision shape 3D for this ramp. We can just make it a box shape and rotate it. Cool. Now let's get the camera to follow up and down when the player jumps and goes up onto the platforms. We'll repeat the line, then convert X to Y. Okay, it snaps the camera down a little lower to match. So we can add an offset of Y. So maybe position plus 1.72 in this case. Okay, you can see it move up to the position it needs to be. And when it drops, it also goes below the screen and it's a little hard to see. Let's also push out the camera to see a bit better when speeding up or dropping. So we have the position X following the ball, position Y for when it jumps, and keeping an offset to be a little higher relative to the ball. The position Z will be our way to move in closer or further away. If the rigid body's linear velocity is higher than, let's say, five, and we go one indent in for the info within here, position Z will equal lerp, where it is at the moment, two plus 15 units on the Z axis over delta time. Now this will be slower and smoother, so let's divide delta by five instead of multiply. And to quickly set what it will do if the linear velocity is below five, simply say else, then copy paste, but let's change it to five in the target's second input. And if you want it to return back closer faster, you could for example change the division to two instead of five. Let's print the linear velocity x to see when it activates and if it activates. Okay, cool. But note this, it only works right, not left at the moment, since going left registers as minus, negative. Now there's no need to make a whole other if or else statement with the code, just use the absolute number. It quickly converts everything above zero, negative will become positive. Awesome. Now it just gives overall velocity left and right the same. As the ball rolls, the camera pulls out, slowly returns as the ball slows down under five velocity. So now you have a foundation for all sorts of gameplay elements, depending on the type of game you want to make. We can add a shield. Maybe a cool gun that you can aim with the other analog stick or numpad arrow keys. Or if you use the arrow keys with your right hand, it could be some other set like the WASD or IJKL buttons. So hold out for part two, it's coming. I think I'll begin with some improvements to the template by limiting the jumps and giving mid-air jumps more consistency. From there, we can add anything that's going to be fun. So let me know some of your ideas. Let's see where it takes us. Happy blending, peace out.